Hey Meisner makers, it's Wednesday and you know what that means, Wednesday workshop at one. So thank you for joining us today. If it's your first time, special welcome to you and we're so glad that you're here. Um, if you're just stumbling across this video and you're wondering what's going on, um, we are, we have made a commitment to um, schedule out a series of what we're calling Wednesday workshop at one. And each week we're taking a look at a tip, a technique, a trick, a project starter, something to get you inspired and um, feed your creativity through this new year. So today, what we're gonna be taking a look at is um, a single quilt block, what I would call a tessellating quilt block. It's one shape that you can put together in different ways and it's all about color placement to create a different look to your to your overall piece um, this can be used to create a segment of a quilt if you're doing a row quilt it would make a nice grouping if you want to use it to do an overall quilt um, it's perfect for that it also is a nice um, project if you want to create some decorator pillows or that kind of thing so the block that we're going to be looking at today is called the tumbler um, if this is a block that you are unfamiliar with, I am a Pinterest junkie. So in the morning when I have my coffee, I like to go to Pinterest and kind of search around and see what's trending, what's new. Um, it really helps to inspire me. And so I was fascinated by the idea of these tumbler quilts. And again, there are just so many different ways that you can lay this out. And it really is about color placement and positioning that creates all kinds of secondary uh, effects using this single tumbler uh, piece. Now, I have cut this out in the past using traditional templates. And I have to say that after cutting the first one with a traditional template, it was really not something that I wanted to do again, um, even as much as I loved this tumbler block. So I was super excited to find the AccuQuilt versions of the tumbler, and they come in two different sizes. There's the larger tumbler block that we see here, or tumbler shape, and then there is the die that has the smaller tumbler shapes here. Um, and both of them are gonna come in handy depending upon what it is that you're doing. So let's take a look um, at first some color variations and then how to cut your tumbler blocks using your AccuQuilt cutting system. So this is one that I put together where I was test driving the, some different colorways and I really like the idea of fabrics that are very blendy. There are four different prints or five different prints that were used um, down through the section of the darker section of the block or of the segment, uh, but they blend together very well. So to me, creating something where they joined each other, I really just liked the look of this. It almost looked like beads coming down through the block itself. Now, when we look at this particular piece, something for you to be thinking about as you're planning your own tumbler block. Uh, I could have opted to use different tone on tone or light fabrics here on the in-between. Just know that doing that, it takes it from, this to me has a very formal look to it. By mixing and matching the tone on tone in the back, I think it would have given it a more relaxed feel. So sometimes creating a small section, if you're planning to stitch an entire quilt, is a nice way to make sure that it's something that you're going to like or love when you get to the finished project. And again, it's all, it's based on personal preference. Which of your layouts, when you audition them, is the one that's gonna speak to you? Which one do you wanna spend the time creating and looking at over time? Or if it's something that you're creating for a gift, which layout um, most reminds you of the person that you plan to gift the finished project to. So that's one option and I'll show you some more in a minute. So with this one, um, one thing that I did was I was very consistent with the alternating blocks using that same orangey print throughout. And then I used a, not a super high contrast, but sort of a medium contrast, random prints throughout. And I really liked the way that that looked at the end. Now, uh, something I want to point out before we get too much further, on this piece, this top is ready to have its borders added to it. And notice that it's been trimmed straight down and straight across the top. You could, on a finished tumbler piece, 
choose to leave uh, this sort of a um, zigzaggy type of an edge. I personally don't want to bind this, which is the reason that I chose to square it off. So it is completely up to you. It is acceptable to use either method, cutting it off and squaring it up or choosing to bind following that shaped edge. The choice is yours. Okay, cameraman Joel, um, the next thing I think that we should show our Meisner makers at home are a couple of other variations on the colorway, and then we'll get to cutting. Before we lay out some additional colorways, uh, something I wanna point out here for our makers at home. This particular layout is ideal for someone who is a less experienced quilter, or you know, if you are needing to get a project done in a hurry. So what I want you to notice is there are no places where my tumbler seams need to intersect or match, okay? So this is a very forgiving way to join your tumbler blocks. If you opt to go with a layout like so, now we have multiple places where we need to be a little bit more careful about our piecing because we do have places where our seams are gonna to need to join in order to keep that visual line very strong. Okay, so it's some, just something for you to be thinking about when you're laying out your tumbler blocks at home. Now, with this particular palette of um, prints that I've selected, they are very, very close together tonally. So as I started rearranging and laying things out, I, I had started with just an alternating of a print and a solid and a print and a solid. And to me, it was um, not quite as dynamic of a layout as what I had in mind. So here, this is the same layout where we're alternating, but I rotated the blocks or the tumblers to see, you know, what, how did I feel about that? And that, you know, that one was okay. I wasn't quite in love with it yet. Um, up here, what I am playing with, and I'm, I think that this might be something I like for fabrics that have a little less um, blend to them, but it's a single, double colored, single, double print. Then the next row down would be double solid, print, double solid, print. And I think this might be something that gets really interesting as I continue to build. And so this is what I would suggest that you do at home as you start playing with the tumbler blocks, is cut up a little bit of fabric, start laying them out, walk away from it, come back and take a look at it again later. And you'll kind of know, um, I call it the stomach ache test. As I walk by, is there one that just makes me go, eh, then that's one I just wanna remove from the grouping. That's your color sense talking to you. If there's one that you keep walking by and just continues to draw your eye, that's probably the layout that you're gonna be happiest with over time. And then once you lay out a larger section of it, let's say that this is the layout that we've decided to go with. I'll go by from time to time and just move around some of the prints just to see if a slightly tweaked arrangement is something I like a little better. Um, it seems to me there's a lot of this fabric happening all at the same place. So, you know, I'll kind of walk around, I'll move them and live with it for a little while and then go back and sew it together. This to me, honestly, is truly the part that takes longer than stitching it together. Um, not because it needs to be a life decision that you're making, but to me, this is just kind of fun, um, sort of like a, a quilter's puzzle to go around and to play with my fabrics and to just enjoy the process and the color. Um, it's very meditative for me. So this is something that I spend a little bit of time with before I commit to putting them all together. So, cameraman Joel, Let's go to the AccuQuilt. Let's cut some of these tumblers out so that our makers at home um, can get their own tumbler quilt started and begin the process of laying their colors out and get to stitching. If you've not worked with an AccuQuilt system before or you're unfamiliar with what the AccuQuilt cutters do, 
Uh, there are three different cutting machines to select from. We're gonna be working with the manual die cutter today. Uh, there's also an electric version of the cutter, which is a little wider and will feed your fabrics through um, at the push of a button. And then there's a travel size, which is a little bit smaller called the Go Me. Um, when you are looking at dies, your packaging will indicate which size cutters that die will work with. So you wanna make sure that you are working, that you select a die that is a, an appropriate size for the cutting system that you have at home. <clears throat> We're gonna be working with the tumbler die that has the three smaller tumblers. Now, again, if you're unfamiliar with this system or you're getting to know your AccuQuilt system, uh, it's nice that there are two different shades of foam here so you know which part of the foam your fabric shapes are gonna be cut from and which part is the scrap, so to speak. Uh, in this area, there are very sharp blades that are down inside. So you want to not put any pressure there or push on it with your hands because again, these are the blades that are gonna cut through our fabric. And your cutting system will cut about six layers of quilt weight fabric at a time. Now with this, you are going to want to use a mat that is the appropriate size for the die that you're working with. Now, a couple of tips. When you're working with your dies, uh, some of the questions that I get is, you know, is there a lot of waste? Is there a lot of scrap? That kind of thing. And the answer is no. When we lay our fabric down to cut for this shape in particular, um, what I'm gonna do is I will measure the widest point on the die and it's just about four inches. So I'm, I would cut my fabric strips about four and a quarter inches. Now also notice that they are kind of coming down here at an angle. That's to help feed the fabrics through the cutter a little more easily. I am gonna lay my fabrics down in line with that. They're not gonna go here and they don't need to cover the entirety of the board. They just need to cover the portion of the die that I wish to cut fabric from. If I only need a few tumblers, I don't need to cover the entirety of the die with fabric. I can just cover the section that I wish to cut. The only place that will cut fabric on your die is where your mat is situated. So if I have my mat this way, even if I have fabric up in this area of the die, it's only gonna cut where the mat is coming into contact with the die itself. So there are a lot of ways that you can position your fabrics on your dies so that we're not wasting fabric. Okay, so for the tumbler die, we measured the widest point and it was just a little shy of four inches. I have cut my fabrics to four and a quarter-ish inches. I don't worry too much about the seam allowances. That'll just get cut off at the end anyway. I am going to, I have my fabric is folded in half. I'm gonna fold it one more time. Now in this case, I'm just gonna fold it one more time because I know from having cut these that this is what's gonna give me the maximum number of tumblers from this particular die. Now, depending on your fabrics, what you may want to do, or if you're using scraps of fabric, you're not using whole lengths of fabric, is bring the seam allowances just past, or the selvages just past the cut area. I would lay my fabric down on my die, fold it back so that that fold is just beyond where the die will cut. Come back to the top, we're doing a little accordion fold here. Flip it back, making sure that the fold is up here even about with the selvage. You need it to be past the blade. Come back down and accordion fold it again. Caution. I now have my fabrics right sides, wrong sides, right sides, wrong sides. This works for this die because my pieces are symmetrical, okay? We're gonna work with another die uh, later on where you need your fabrics all stacked right sides up or right sides down. 
for this particular die and for the way that we are cutting for this project, it doesn't matter. But keep that in mind when you're cutting your fabrics. There are times when they will need to stack all in the same direction. There are times when it doesn't matter. If in doubt, refer to the instructions that came with your die or to the AccuQuilt website. Okay, so let's get this positioned correct properly since that was sort of a quick layout there of our fabrics. I'm going to place the mat over the die so that my fabric is sandwiched between the die and the mat. Now, also another tip, over time, your mat will wear out. Your mat doesn't have to be centered over the die. It just has to be over the portion of the die where the blades are. So you can move the die around so that it's wearing in different spots on the mat itself. That'll help you, uh, that'll give you some more life on your mats. Okay, and then we're just gonna run that through. Don't need to leave your ruler on your cutter. And then I like to drag my mat just a little bit because sometimes with static electricity, my fabric will stick to my mat. And then we're gonna pull away the scrap. And we now have our tumbler pieces. Cut and ready to be joined. All right, something I neglected to mention, and this is super important. When we are working with AccuQuilt dies, one of the advantages, in addition to the fact that it is gonna cut your fabrics for you very precisely, very quickly, in the case where you have shapes that would have what are known in the quilt world as dog ears, those have been removed from your shapes so it's that much easier, number one, to stitch the shapes together accurately, but it also eliminates the need for you to then have to go back through later and trim that. So that's another advantage to using um, something like the AccuQuilt system uh, versus traditional templates. Now be kind to yourself if you have used a tone-on-tone -tone fabric and lay all of your tone-on-tone -tone pieces going in one direction, meaning right sides up or right sides down. That way, once you get into a rhythm and you start piecing, you won't find that you've gotten, you know, 72 pieces into your quilt and somewhere in the middle, you have one where your fabric is wrong sides up. If you are stitching together randomly, then you're ready to go. If you have done something where you have planned it up on your design wall, I like to take my fabrics down one row at a time stitch all the way across that row, then get the next row, stitch all the way across. That way I can keep my colors where they belong. As with most traditional quilting patterns, we are using a quarter inch seam allowance. So you do want a quarter inch foot on your machine. I prefer a foot that's flat on the bottom for this particular um, quilting shape, uh, just because it makes it a little easier for me to see where those cutouts from the dog ears are. So I would have my um, fabrics laid out. I'm gonna lay them right sides together as we do for any other quilt or piecing project. Now notice when I lay these together, right sides um, together, that it's kind of an unusual, where do I lay things out? How do I know that they're matching correctly? This is where that little um, flat edge at the top and at the bottom of the segment come in handy. So on your die, where it's cut those for you, you know that this is exactly where you need your sides to your ends to align and your long straight edge to align. So now when we place this under the machine to stitch, all we need to worry about is keeping the edge of our quarter inch foot right along the long straight edge of our fabric. And I would stitch all the way down through now, depending on how complicated your design pattern is, um, how crucial it is to having particular fabrics lined up, I would probably not chain piece in this case because I was being very um, specific about my fabric choices. So I would do the one, then the next piece, the next piece, the next piece, working down through that first row, and then I would go back and do the next row. 
So to join the next piece of fabric, same thing. We want those little short edges to align. We want our long edge to align. Raw edges of the fabric aligned with the edge of our quarter inch foot. And stitch. And we would continue in that same manner, joining our fabrics together until the entire row is completed. So we have two small strips here that are ready to be joined together. Now in real life, you would stitch all the way across your row, then do the next row before you stitch the two rows together. But what I wanna show you is uh, how we join the rows. Okay, so in real life, make sure you stitch your entire strip together. Once I have two rows completed, I'll take them to the ironing board and I will press the first row and I'll just be random, right? Do I want my tumblers to the outside or to the inside? It really doesn't matter. But however I press the top row, I'm going to press its neighbor in the opposite direction, okay? So here I've pressed them going this direction so that when I stitch the two rows together, the spot where, oh, I did them backwards, <laughs> this way. The spot where the seam lines intersect, the seam allowances should be going in opposite directions so that they will lock together. So I'm gonna quickly repress this one. I didn't follow my own directions. And remember that anytime you are pressing, when we're piecing, it really is pressing not ironing because you don't want to distort your stitching. Okay, now seam allowance is going this way, seam allowance is going this way, so that when I fold my fabrics together, do you see how those seam allowances butt up against each other and they become a little wall? So now when I get ready to stitch, it's gonna be that much easier for me to make sure that my seams align correctly to create a nice, strong visual across the quilt. So those seams just lock, and here, everything matches up exactly like it's supposed to. Now, which way are we gonna press our seam allowances at this point? It is totally up to you, because once you've gone all the way across the row, there isn't anything that I'm going to be joining other than perhaps a border, and the border wouldn't have any joins. So I can press up or down. Most likely, I would press them all going in one direction, probably towards the top of my quilt. But again, it's not critical. Um, there are some who do like to press their seam allowances open when you have this type of a, a join. It is completely up to you. I find they behave a little better going in one direction or the other. Now, for anybody who gasped when I said press them open, Traditionally, we press our seam allowances to one side or the other, and that's something that uh, started when quilting was primarily done, not piecing, but the quilting was done by hand versus machine. And when you press all your seam allowances to one side or the other, it gave you a section at every seam line where you had minimal bulk to stitch through. It's much more difficult by hand to needle through the six layers of fabric where I've pressed my seam allowances up than it is to needle through the one um, layer of fabric and batting. So that's the traditional reason for pressing your seams to one side or the other. For something like this, it is perfectly acceptable to press them open. So I hope you have enjoyed today's segment on uh, the tumbler block, and I really, really would love to see what you choose to do with your own tessellating tumbler block quilts. Hope to see you next week. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please email me at info, I-N-F-O, at meisnersewing.com.